Neil. Thank you so much for coming, especially at, at least where I am, uh, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. I know for people on the West Coast, it's earlier. So just as kind of a bit of a format, each of our presenters is going to be given about 30 minutes, and I'm leaving it up to the presenters. If they want to use all of 30 minutes to present their work in honor of me, then that's fine. Um, if they only want to do about 15, then we can have about a 15-minute Q&A. So if you if we get to the point when we're going to do a Q&A, please use the raise your hand function. Um, it's down at the bottom of your screen. Or if you are having difficulty with the raise your hand function, feel free to send me a direct message and I will put you in the queue for the Q&A. Or if you would rather not specifically ask your question directly, you can just send me the question and then I can just ask it more broadly. All right. So without further ado, we will start with Diana Taylor from John Carroll University presenting Violent Bodies Revisited. I'm unmuted, yeah. Uh, okay, so I want to first thank quickly Shay for organizing this event. Um, and I'm so glad to be able to be part of it to talk about the work. I'm a brilliant scholar and a great friend and mentor to me. So I'm um, thank you. Uh, I'm going, I have some slides because I have, it'll, I think, move my presentation along. I want to have time for QA. So I'm going to share my screen and bring that up. Um, if I can do that, yeah, um, should be here. Uh, let me, it, can you all see it? Good. Okay. This big, put that there. So I got to go to the beginning here. Okay. So I'm going to read my paper, but as I said, I'm going to refer to the slides because it will help things move a little more quickly. So Violent Bodies, it's the title of um, the final chapter of Ami's book, um, The Subject of Violence, her uh, 2002 book. Uh, go back. And so I wanted to have a, a look at that uh, chapter because I know that a lot of her work focused on violence within the context of armed conflicts like genocide, war, and terrorism. But I'm interested in this chapter because of the um, my current work. I'm, I'm looking at feminist counterviolence in response to violence against women. And I want to be clear that when I refer to women during this presentation, I'm referring to cis and trans women. And so I want to start off with a, a little epigraph from Andrea Dworkin. She says, when we women find the courage to defend ourselves, to take a stand against brutality and abuse, we are violating every notion of womanhood we have ever been taught. The weight of freedom for women is bound to be torturous for that reason alone. So in Violent Bodies, Ami argues from an Arendtian perspective that cultivating violent women bodies, that's her term, can be ethically and politically justified if, first, its nature and scope are narrowly defined, and second, if it is undertaken as part of an overall project aimed at countering men's systemic gender-based violence against women, if, in other words, such, cultiva such cultivation is characteristically feminist. So in what I'm going to say, I'm offering support for Ami's position, and I'm also going to distinguish my own stance from hers. First of all, we offer different readings of Arendt's work in her book on violence, and our broader philosophical influences overlap as well as diverge. While I don't address it here, I think world events, as well as Ami's and my respective experiences of violence also play a role in similarities and differences in our approaches. So ultimately I endorse what I think is a broader understanding and deployment of feminist counterviolence than on my reading Ami does, and I do so with less hesitation and ambivalence. Ami says that part of the reason for her ambivalence toward feminist counterviolence stems in part from her desire to distinguish 
between what she refers to as a ready to fight body, a body primed for violence, and a violent body that actualizes the violence of which it is capable. She describes this distinction between the ready to fight body and the violent body as being, quoting her, very thin. At the same time, she wants to maintain it in part because she worries that in cultivating her own ready to fight body, she is unintentionally reproducing conditions for the possibility of the very violence that through doing so she wishes to counter. And this is what she says about that. And I won't read it for time's sake, but I'll leave it up here on the screen. So what she goes on to show is that at least when the violent women bodies in question actualize violence in carefully circumscribed ways as part of a feminist agenda, violent men's bodies and violent women's bodies are not ethico-politically equivalent. Violent men bodies reflect, reproduce, and enforce gender oppression, whereas violent feminist women bodies oppose it. Ami finds in Arendt's work support for quoting her, a means to end justification for the production of the implements of violence that is limited temporally and in its scope, end quote. Asserting that bodies can be one such implement, she then proceeds to show paradoxically given Arendt's view of feminism as a self-interested and therefore non or even anti-political movement, that the production of violent women bodies is ethically, ethically politically justifiable from an Arendtian perspective only if those bodies are feminist. Like Arendt, Ami cautions that as a form of action, violence is characteristically unpredictable its effects can never be fully anticipated. And despite our best efforts to contain it in the ways Arendt and Ami describe, that is to limit it to an immediate response to a specific action or event, violence still has the potential to break loose from the boundaries of its intended aims. And as Ami puts it, run amok. At the same time, however, it is precisely this transgressive potential of violence its ability to transcend existing limits, like norms, that make it political from an Arendtian perspective. So Ami says here, and I won't read it because it's on the screen, and what I see her saying here is that neither cultivating a ready-to-fight body nor actualizing such a body through the use of feminist counterviolence is inherently anti-political or unethical from an Arendtian perspective. And I agree with this stance at the same time that I want to make a stronger claim that feminist counterviolence, either in the form of cultivating a ready to fight body or a violent body is both ethical and necessary. In other words, I see Ami providing more of a negative justification for the use of feminist counterviolence. And I want to justify it on positive grounds. In my view, the ethical politics of counterviolence, feminist or otherwise, do not require its use to be limited to an immediate response to an immediate and specific threat. Rather, I think counterviolence would be ethically justified and politically effective when it is de deployed more broadly against oppressive systems. And I think there is support for this position in Arendt's work. At least part of the reason I break with Ami's reading of Arendt is that my entry point into Arendt's work on violence is what she has to say about rage. That this is the case is not coincidental because my work posits rage as the affective response to oppression, a response that as Arendt shows, opens onto but does not necessarily lead to violence. In part three of On Violence, Arendt offers a critical response to the view that human violence is inherently, sorry, is inherent and therefore natural on the one hand and merely irrational on the other. Rage, she writes, can be irrational and pathological, but so can every other human affect, end quote. She points out moreover that contra the Western philosophical equation of affective detachment with objectivity, an absence of emotion does not signify the existence of rationality. Responding rationally 
and therefore reasonably and effectively to events of the world and other people requires the capacity, quoting Arendt, to be moved. Not affective responses, but their lack, she argues, is pathological. And she refers to this as a perversion of feelings. That affective responses can be stifled and withheld shows that the capacity to be moved is not simply given and that rage, therefore, does not arise automatically. Conditions which give rise to it, according to Arendt, do not include, quoting her, misery and suffering, end quote. Natural disasters, she asserts, do not generally or primarily provoke rage. The extermination and concentration camps were not met with, quoting her, rage and violence, end quote, but rather with their conspicuous absence, a response she describes as being, quote, the clearest sign of dehumanization, end quote. Where rage does appear, then, is in the face of injustice, which she describes as conditions under which, quote, there is reason to suspect that things could be changed, but they are not, end quote. Unjust conditions for event are thus fundamentally contradictory and hypocritical. They're contradictory in the sense that change is needed and possible, but this change is denied, the need for the change is denied, and the change is therefore blocked. Unjust conditions are hypocritical because words are used to conceal rather than reveal, and appeals to reason are invoked to deflect, prevaricate, and entrap. It is in part two of On Violence that Arendt elucidates the point Ami foregrounds in violent bodies that insofar as violence is a means, it is always in need of justification. I think Arendt's presentation of rage as a reasonable response to injustice in part three provides that justification. To be clear, providing a justification doesn't mean that somebody unequivocally endorses this. As Ami shows, Arendt cautions that because of its volatile and potentially uncontainable nature, violence is most, of, most effectively utilized in the interest of achieving immediate short-term aims. The farther its intended end recedes into the future, she writes, the more the use of violence loses its plausibility, end quote. At the same time, and consistent with Arendt's tendency to take positions that appear to be or simply are in tension with themselves, she also makes quite clear that sometimes violence is the only possible response. And here is where she says this, and I wanna unpack this a little bit. This passage strikes me as extremely important for several reasons. First, as I've already noted, it reflects an unequivocal assertion by Arendt that sometimes violence is simply required. Arguing that violence is the only way to right some injustices also seems to suggest that in these instances, the usual required justifications for its use, that it be limited and immediate, may not apply. Second, Arendt's point in the second part of the passage resonates quite strongly with a passage from Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex that Ami herself cites in Violent Bodies. And this is from Beauvoir. Beauvoir is saying here that as embodied beings, our capacity for violence is a fundamental means by way of which we come to constitute, understand, and relate to ourselves. Denying certain groups that capacity by, for example, pathologizing their violence and fostering modes of self-relation in which they experience their own capacity for violence as pathological is therefore to deny those groups access to the full range of experience through which freedom may be actualized. Arendt is making the same point, I think, when she says that rage and therefore by extension violence are fundamentally human and that denying them to some groups is dehumanizing. To be clear, like Arendt, Beauvoir is not saying that human beings are inherently violent. Rather, she considers violence to be an unavoidable effect of the tension and conflict that characterize an ambiguous human existence. 
Finally, then, this passage from Arendt's work interests me because Ami doesn't cite it in violent bodies. Maybe she simply interpreted the passage differently. Maybe it didn't catch her attention because she doesn't approach Arendt's work on violence through her remarks on rage. Still, it seems to me that Ami must have noticed the similarities between this passage from On Violence and the one from The Second Sex that she does cite. And so I wonder why Beauvoir and not Arendt, and I wish I could ask her about this. Our respective readings of Arendt are not the only point of difference in Ami's and my views concerning when and how feminist counterviolence may be exercised in politically effective and ethical ways. My work on counterviolence generally and feminist counterviolence more specifically is grounded in the tradition of critical phenomenology. I draw most heavily upon Beauvoir's work, but I also engage that of France Fanon, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and Rent herself. And Michel Foucault's work continues to frame my understanding of the nature and function of power relations within contemporary Western societies. Like Beauvoir and Fanon, as well as Arendt and Ami, I understand violence as a manifestation of the human capacity for action. And here's the uh, bullet points of my other ways of understanding some of these important concepts. Um, and I won't read through it. I'll leave it there for y'all to have a look at and I'll come back to it. But I do wanna emphasize that feminist counterviolence takes the form of embodied responses to the violence against women that grounds, reproduces, reinforces, minimizes, and thus legitimizes gender oppression. So I'll go back to this and then I'll flip again to the other slide. Approaching counterviolence through the work of the thinkers I've mentioned alleviates but does not eradicate concern about the ethical politics of counterviolence, feminist or otherwise. Beauvoir, Fanon, and Merleau-Ponty are firm in their stance that counterviolence needs to be part of resistance against oppressive political systems. They focus primarily on fascism and colonialism that rely upon violence for their reproduction. Systems for which, in other words, violence is not merely an effect, but also a condition of possibility. In the face of oppression, Beauvoir writes, quoting her, the oppressed has only one solution, to deny the harmony of that mankind from which an attempt is made to exclude him, to prove that he is a man and that he is free by revolt, end quote. Revolt is ethical because it reestablishes reciprocity among human beings. It restores the ambiguity of existence and with it, the conditions for the possibility of freedom. As the passage cited earlier from the second sex makes clear, to be a meaningful actualization of human freedom, revolt must manifest in the body. And Fanon makes the same point. Counterviolence has to be on the table as one possible way in which revolt is expressed. My understanding of gender oppression affirms my belief that a broader use of feminist counterviolence is not only ethical, but politically effective and necessary. I see normative gender, normative gender, as an oppressive political system. Violent gendered relations of power ground and are reproduced through major social and political institutions, including those which function as resources for victim survivors, such as law enforcement, courts of law, and social services. Violence against women infuses fundamental structures of society. Whether carried out by state or non-state actors, it is both implicitly and more overtly legitimized and sanctioned by the state. Official institutional interventions can therefore only manage men's gender-based violence against women. They are designed to deal with it after the fact. The vast majority of feminists in contrast wish to prevent and ultimately eradicate oppressive gendered violence. Contemporary feminists, many of whom Ami cites in Violent Bodies, including Anne Cahill, Marth Martha McCoy, and Sharon Marcus make a strong case for the potential of feminist self-defense to facilitate these objectives, as did Beauvoir herself. Men use violent, violence against women in their language as well as in their gestures, Beauvoir observes. They assault women, they rape them, insult them, and certain looks are aggressions. 
Women must equally defend themselves with violence, end quote. Self-defense falls within the limitations AMI advocates concerning the use of feminist counterviolence. It is actualized in response to an immediate attack in the moment when it occurs. My view of normative gender as an oppressive political system points to the need for additional broader feminist strategies through which counterviolence may be deployed. Elements of grassroots embodied transgressive and preventative strategies developed within the women's liberation movement, including but not limit, limited to those aimed at reclaiming and transforming public space and those which target known violent men might, be, might prove effective within a contemporary context, provided they are developed and deployed from an intersectional perspective. The impulse to reject such actions as vigilantism needs to be resisted especially given the reality that when it comes to violence against women, the law functions as what Foucault refers to as a productive failure. Sexual and intimate partner violence law fail if we see their aim as serving victim survivors. When it comes to reproducing oppressive gendered relations of power, on the other hand, they are wildly successful. I identify interesting possibilities for feminist counterviolence for feminist counter-violence advocates and anti-carceral feminists, for example, to form coalition in the face of this productive failure. Arendt tells us that acts in which men take the law into their own hands for justice's sake are in conflict with the constitutions of civilized communities, but that does not mean that they are in, inhuman or merely emotional, end quote. The line between bodies that enforce and oppose oppression, between oppressive violence and counterviolence, may indeed be thin. But Ami is right that it cannot be maintained if feminist debate about, quoting her, what is at stake and at issue, quote, end quote, with, the, with respect to the active configuration of violent bodies, and that's another quote from her, is simply foreclosed. She shows us that both engaging questions about the ethics and politics of feminist counterviolence and engaging in that violence itself needs to be undertaken thoughtfully and self-critically, as well as collectively and in solidarity with other feminists. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we've got about nine minutes or so for Q&A. So again, please, if you have a question, utilize the raise your hand function or um, you can post it in the chat if you're having trouble. Okay, so first question I've got, Naomi. Uh, thank you for that. Very challenging and interesting. Um, can you give an example, um, sort of concrete, specific, real or fictional, of uh, the sort of feminist counterviolence that you have in mind? Yeah, um, so self-defense is definitely part of it. I think self-defense has a big role to play. Um, and so, but I, like I said, I, I want to think about it more broadly and I get some inspiration, as I mentioned, from um, the women's liberation movement, the, the writings from the anti-rape um, movement, because part of what they did, and I think they did it in large part in response to the failure of official avenues, at least from what I've read, um, is to confront um, men in neighborhoods who were known to be violent offenders, right? Um, and identify them, publicize their identity, and confront them physically if needed. Um, it's not a US context, but a group that I'm very interested in is the Gulabi gang in India, right? And they function primarily in rural areas where law enforcement is completely ineffective in dealing with violence against women, rampant violence against women. 
So I've also been in conversation recently, as I mentioned, with anti-carceral feminists who are engaging in grassroots activism in their communities, helping victim survivors of violence. And they do some of what I'm talking about, physically confronting and removing, rather than, you know, their, their stance is, why should women and children be the ones who have to flee their homes? They go in and they make men leave, right? And they deal with them to get them out in whatever way they need to be able to do that. And so I, I hope that helps. These are things I'm still thinking through because I'm still looking at concrete examples. But these are some of the kinds of things that seem to have been effective or that currently are effective. Um, and so this is the sort of concrete practice that I'm thinking about, as well as protest, right? As well as feminist protest, political protest. I think we see instances of counter-violence there as well in terms of bodily confrontation. Great, thank you so much. So we have Shay and then Yasmin and then Anne. Thank you for your paper, Diana. I really liked it. Um, I have a question about the distinction between potential violent bodies and, and actual violent bodies. And Ami, so Ami's concern about right vigilanteism, um, but also knowing that she was coming from this place where Ami was was a super badass, like she did a lot of training in martial arts and other things, from what I remember. Um, and so I agree with with your position, a more positive position that uh, women should have you know, more violent opportunities, if that's the way to say it. And I was wondering if you would think that maybe Ami would be amenable to the claim that just as we tell women that it becomes a pretty necessary part of self-care to engage in therapy, that it's also a pretty necessary part of self-care to engage in training the kind of training that Ami did that made her write this in the first place, right? So different kinds of, of fighting trainings, right? So that women as a whole can develop um, act, uh, potential violent bodies, right? And as such be able to, in principle, likely ward off male violence. So there's a sense in which having a firm collective potential violent body can ward off actual violence from the outside, which would satisfy some of the conditions that both of y'all are interested in, such that only a fool, <laughs> only a fool would dare, right, um, mess with women. And that the idea that women could, because a lot of times men, Men aren't afraid of women coming into their homes and getting rid of them because they don't think that women can do anything to them, right? They don't think that even five women could remove them from their home. But if it were the case that men knew that women could go in and get them out, that they would be less inclined. And that the concern for mass vigilanteism that is, right, is a problem would be alleviated. So I'm kind of wondering if, if you would make such a prescription to kind of avoid some of the concerns that Arantanami had. Yeah, I, I think I, I absolutely do. And I agree. Um, I mean, one of the things that Anne Cahill talks about in terms of defending self-defense, she says, look, I'm advocating women's cultivation of, you know, to use Ami's language, women's cultivation of a violent, uh, of a, um, ready to fight body, um, not in order to validate neoliberal views that, that it's on women to defend themselves. She says it's because doing that kind of training, and, and Martha McCauley talks about this in her book, um, Real Knockouts, as well, it, it, it completely counters the kind of cultivation of a feminine body in the way that, you know, Iris Young talks about in Throwing Like a Girl, right? It gives women an empowering experience of their own embodiment. And I think, I think, so Shay, part of what I hear you saying is, 
I think men need to know that women can do this. And I think women, I, women need to know that they can do it, right? They need to develop the embodied confidence and the embodied modes of existence that facilitate the kind of action that we're talking about. And, you know, I think, yeah, I, I, my reading of Ami's work is that she would be supportive of that. I, I think she's more hesitant. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, there's just so many things it's like, I wish I could have, I wish I'd had these conversations with her, you know, I wish I had done, I wish I'd been able to do that. So I would love to hear what she would say about it. I, I, I mean, and we could talk about it more, but I think there are, I think, so I'll just put it out there, right? Ami was a, 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 a practitioner of violence in ways that I am not. And I suspect that I was, I'm probably, um, been subjected to violence in ways that maybe she was not. So I, so part of what I think is that we're coming at it from those, and I think she might, you know, I've, I've, I've had conversations, for example, with um, former members of the IRA, right, who are super critical of young Republicans in the north of Ireland who want to go, who are advocating violence. They've said things to me like, Anybody who had ever had to experience this would never want to go through it again. And I wonder if that's part of Ami's stance that's that's coming through in her work. And I totally appreciate it, but I'm trying to navigate that space in a in a in a way that's pushing things maybe a little bit more than I see her pushing them. Okay, y'all. So we've only got maybe like two, three minutes tops. So if um, we could I don't know if you guys mean if your question's really short or I can make it really short. Okay, perfect. And no, then depending on Diana's answer, then we might have to end it that way. We can make sure that Mecca can have time. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add to I guess Shay's point, and I think you've already touched upon it, Diana, with this ready to fight body uh, as distinguished from a fighting body. Uh, to be able to give concrete examples of um, feminist counter violence. But also I wonder, and I'm not gonna ask this, like pose that a question for you to respond to right now, but maybe for like the furthering of the project, uh, what you would think of this reclaiming of a body, especially a traumatized body that may not be very ready to get ready to fight. Uh, and I wonder how socialization and different types of socialization outside of, or like trying to counter actual op oppressive structures of femininity in society may help uh, get us to a point of becoming a ready to fight body, uh, if that makes sense, but that's all, thank you. Yeah, no, and that's a great question. So I, I think, I mean, part of what I'm really trying to push at quite hard in my own work is, it's interesting, I think there's, I think the, the transformation, so the, the relation of self to self and the relation of self to others and world is of course interconnected, right? So when transforming one's own mode of embodied existence changes one's orientation in the world. And then that, as Shay was saying, like if, if that starts to be cultivated broadly among women, then I think that has the potential to then promote a kind of pushing back against gender, as I'm saying, as a violent political system, that can start to change. And then that again opens onto more possibilities for individual self-transformation. So I think I see those things as interconnected. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think we're gonna cut off the Q&A now in order to give Mecca Nagel enough time. So if you could please join me in thanking Diana, virtual claps all around. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to Mecca Nagel from the State University of New York presenting Cortland Between Violence and Power Deficits. Uh, thank you, Tempest. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so dear Lisa, uh, dear conference organizers, uh, specifically Shay and Saba, thank you for bringing us together and to honor um, and celebrate the life and thought of our friend and comrade uh, Ami Baon, ba um, Ami Baon rather, and my comments will focus on her contribution um, between dem democracy and violence, which in turn honored feminist political philosophers uh, Iris Young's work in the Gedenkschrift uh, Dancing with Iris, just here, and are you there? <laughs> 
we uh, were happy to put this together for you all and, and was published in 2009. And so in that article, Ami wrestles with Young's admittedly novice approach to Arendt's notion of power. She credits uh, Young with applying Arendt's differentiation of power and violence. And so Young, uh, in Ami's quote, here opens a space to rethink military humanitarian intervention in terms of a justificatory trajectory that includes questions about the relation of power and violence among the consequential considerations that are taken into account when assessing such intervention, unquote. So regarding military humanitarian intervention, Ami gives us two definitions. First, the military is not an entity to be strongly associated with the state, but rather to a wide variety of organized armed forces whose tasks can go beyond the Im immediate threat and use of violence. And secondly, humanitarian means a claimed justificatory connection to a humanitarian crisis that is understood roughly in terms of violations of human rights. In the end, Ami differs from Young by adopting what I think is a quasi realpolitik approach to military humanitarian intervention, given that we live in a, quote, non-ideal world with a large international power deficit. Yeah, and power deficit is really Ami's word, replacing Young's um, problematic word, Im impotence, and really drawing on Chantal Mouffe's word of democracy um, deficit. Yeah. So in the case of post-war former Yugoslavia, Ami agrees with Habermas that such intervention was justified. I assume this is the case in order to create not only you know, dealing with violations of human rights issues, but also to create democratic governance structures, specifically, of course, transitional justice apparatus. I must say that I am conflicted about this perspective. Uh, at a conference in Poland about a decade ago, I met a survivor of the siege of Sarajevo, uh, who's, who lived through it for those four long years where some 14,000 people were killed and ended only in 1996. And there's no doubt that he was haunted by the trauma on a daily basis. However, NATO engaged in warfare against Serbia much later in 1999, killing thousands of people. And today, uh, Serbians are still dying from the after effects of bombardment, of the use of cluster bombs, depleted uranium, noxious gas emissions, etc. None of these collateral effects are thematized in Ami's chapter. She instead focuses on the liberation of Kosovo uh, from the Serbian aggression. Now, here's a Serbian critic's voice, and it's a rather lengthy quote here. We have to clarify that the NATO war was neither an intervention nor an aerial campaign, nor a small Kosovo war, not even a mere bombing, but instead an illegal aggression committed without a United Nations Security Council's approval, a blatant violation of the UN Charter, the OSCE Final Act, the fundamental principles of international law, and most notably, violation of the NATO Founding Act of 1949 and respective nation constitutions of the latter member states. This was a, the first war on European soil since World War II, waged against an independent and sovereign state, which neither attacked nor otherwise threatened either NATO or any of its individual member states. Thus, NATO inflicted a heavy blow to the legacies of World War II and of the agreements reached in Tehran, Yalta, Potsdam, and Helsinki. Uh, this is the voice of Zivadin Jovanovic, uh, the president of the Belgian Forum of, for World of Equals. He said that in March 2021, this year. And he, you must note, he was the former Serbian Minister of Foreign Affairs during that bombardment campaign of NATO. Now, Ami's article circumvents the jacuzzi tenor of the politician. She sides with Habermas and Contra Young that used ad bellum that, that NATO's warfare against Serbia was deployed in a legitimate man manner. She provides the following justification. The UN and other bodies offer a limited way to, amount, to mount some military humanitarian interventions in some humanitarian crisis. Unquote. 
I mean, it's asked, but did the UN actually sanction NATO warfare in this case? Because the U United Nations didn't approve the US government's aggression against Iraq, and therefore Habermas actually approved of the German government's refusal, Merkel's government, to send German troops to Iraq. Furthermore, Ami argues that the K-4 soldiers deployed, deployed by NATO adhered to the ideal principles of use post bellum, post-war justice. And according to NATO's own news report, they are still deployed through the pandemic, down now from 16,000 troops they had in 2008 now to 3,500. However, I'm less sanguine about their positive contributions. For a human rights report from 2004 indicates violent reprisals driven by revenge, while K4 soldiers and others um, pass, uh, stood passively by. So here's a quote from uh, Human Rights Watch. The widespread attacks by ethnic Albanians on Serbs, Roma, Ashkali, that is Albanian speak speaking Roma, and other non-Albanian minorities are a cause for grievous concern. Of equal concern, however, are the near collapse of the international security organizations in Kosovo when confronted by the violence and unrest of March 2004, and the inability of K4 UN, MIK, international police, and the local KPS to provide effective protection to Kosovo's minority communities during the two days of violence. Uh, granted, I have not seen other reports of such serious examples of non-protection of ethnic minorities, um, including Serbs, since 2004, but it would have been good to note a bit of skepticism about K4 NATO troops, and I'm puzzled by op Ami's optimism um, and their effective deployment to create general conditions of peace. Ami is clear about a robust reading of use post bellum, though. It must, quote, generate, renew, augment, and stabilize, unquote, people's power and clearly deal with resettlement and provide general human rights guarantees. And she thinks that K4 did so admirably. Now, my second um, part of my comments uh, deal with um, the concepts of power and powerlessness. Ami's article also give, gives me opportunity to ponder about Iris and Young's um, ambivalent, maybe incoherent, use of power. Ami notes correctly that Young did not work in the field of theory of violence. Only in Young's uh, later work does she make use of uh, Arendtian's modernist insights of legitimation of power as backward looking in contrast to the justification of violence as forward looking. How do we make sense of Young's use of the Foucauldian postmodern power knowledge conceptualization? It seems we need a bifurcated approach for a systems analysis dealing with dem democratization processes. And it is noteworthy that in our anthology that I, and I published, there are actually two articles, namely Amis and then that of Margaret Denik, which uh, both analyze Young's late work on violence. Ami focuses on Young's discovery of Arendt, while Denik exclusively explores Young's Foucauldian analysis in critiquing the prot protection racket of security states. Even though Ami notes that Young doesn't focused on violence in her work on democratic theory, Ami does not mention that in the famous Five Faces of Oppression article, and I see Laurie Grün here um, in our audience, um, who wrote a wonderful article of applying the Five Faces to uh, animals and um, non-human animals, Young mentions both violence and powerlessness as two faces respectively. Perhaps that essay could be revisited with an Arendtian and Baron analysis or lens. In any case, I note a certain asymmetry in the five faces and arguably the oppressive face of powerlessness would be better, better recast as in, in terms of the diet of forced domination or subjugation or exclusion. Four of the faces describe a hegemonic agentic mode, whereas powerlessness is constitutive only of those who are targeted. In other words, the four faces, exploitation, marginalization, violence, and cultural imperialism, describe the actors of oppression and what they do upon those who are subjugated or objectified. An actor who engages in oppressive conduct and has institutional backing to do so is not powerless. 
But if we use the Arendtian perspective, this phase could be subsumed by phase, the phase of violence, because those who use violence instrumentally already have lost their grip of the use of power. So in an Arendtian sense, then such violent actors are indeed powerless. Uh, by contrast, Foucauldian analysis of the term would suggest that powerlessness is nonsensical. If I understand power knowledge correctly, having less power or being empowered are not really of concern in what Young calls Foucault's own paradigm shifting accounts of productive and disciplinary power. However, in Arendtian or even King or Fanon's terms, those who are, don't have power are driven to use violence instrumentally to achieve their objectives such as self-determination. And we certainly have heard a lot of clarification of that in Diana's uh, fabulous um, paper. Um, Ami's concept of power deficit can also be productive in rethinking cosmopolitan or Kantian perceptual peace positions. What is still posited here is a naturalized nation state and in settler colonial countries, the nation and its concomitant concept of imagined community are deeply troubled ideals, if not violent concepts, ex excising indigenous claims to sovereignty and self-determination. So in my conclusion, what are feasible alternatives to violence? In order to build power potential, Ami invokes building community relations and forms of responsibility among neighbors. It's one of the examples she gives. Today, we would consider perhaps neighborhood mutual aid associations and violence disruptors in, a, in the spirit of a movement of Black Lives, or for Black Lives, that seeks to defund state violence at the street level, where police are uh, surely considered violent agents of the state. Police brutality as such was a concern of Iris Young, as Ami points out in her article. But according to Young, a police force is legitimate where it maintains the legal order with some in inevitable modicum of coercion. However, as a penal abolitionist, I find that policing is only one violent facet of the oppressive institution of the criminal legal system in general. Personally, I would appeal with Angela Davis to the notion of um, ab abolition and democracy, first postulated by W.E.B. Du Bois, to rethink all social and political institutions from the ground up. Perhaps a good model of the, is the good governance principle of the Zapatistas who continue to hold widespread indigenous support despite severe Mexican government repression. Their recent tours sailing to Spain to reconquer it peacefully after 500 years of violent suppression and genocidal imperialism um, is to me a ludic obuntic expression of decolonial internationalist abolition democratic pursuits. What does ludic ubuntu mean? I suggest that indigenous peacemaking is always focused on intersubjectivity, on a caring relationship with the other. Forgiveness is one such phase uh, which the reconquistadoras expressively refuse. Uh, this is not surprising because peacemaking, especially with respect to enduring global st structural injustice and racial capitalism, is an extensive process of accountability. Here we can debate whether Iris Young's critique of the liability approach is helpful, uh, in addition to Margaret McLaren and uh, Anne Ferguson's amplification of Young's approach as one that envisions relational cosmopolitanism uh, and uh, solidarity practices. Ami's article gives much opportunity to reflect on power violence and power deficits while we reflect on various aspects of democratic theory. I hope my contribution here brought out some of the tensions that we face as social justice theorists who are wedded to the post rawsian non-ideal epistemic dimensions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Right, so as before, um, we have about a little over 10 minutes for q and um, I'll probably go a bit over since we had a few introductory marks and I want to give um, Mecca equitable time. So if you do have any questions, please go down to the bottom of your screens, hit reactions, and there is a raise your hand and I will make a cue or you can message me directly. <laughs> 
And if folks want to uh, combine questions, maybe address some to Diana. I know there was still folks who were um, want to ask Diana. I'm I'm totally fine with that too. We do have a question from Melissa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mecca. That was really really interesting. And of course, what what really what really perked up my ears was the phrase that you used, "ludic Ubuntu." And I just I, I can't help wanting to hear more about what it is that you what it is that you're saying when you use that phrase and what you have in mind by it. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Um, um, I'm actually writing this book about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought. <laughs> right? uh, so I couldn't help myself to sneak it in here, right? Um, it is really, uh, I mean, it, Ubuntu is a Southern African concept, right? Um, uh, about seeing each other. So it's a politics and ethic of recognition, right? And uh, it really came to the fore in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, where Archbishop Tutu said, well, you know, there, we need to do something differently in the post um, apartheid, uh, post colonial, and new South Africa. And, um, you know, so it was, I mean, in, in Tutu's, concept, he stresses a lot of, um, you know, forgiveness being the way forward, right? And I know I'm going to get push pushback in this audience, especially with Diane's paper, it's like, forgiveness, are you correct? You know, um, and so it is this wrestling with that concept. And Ludic really refers to my earlier work on play, right? And so it, it is to look at games that we play um, from the games of violence, the warfare, in the prison system, right, of non-recognition of the other to moving us, you know, sort of in a spiraling way um, to uh, um, a playful being communing with the other. So it's, for, sorry, folks, it's uh, quite spiritual where I'm going. It's the post-secular turn that I'm, I'm suggesting here um, that uh, um, violent expressions responses this will will only beget more violence. So it's I'm actually much more interested in that whole non-violentist um, approach uh, of you know um, various folks um, and, and not just um, Tutu but certainly Martin Luther King and others. Yeah. Don't know if that helps you. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Thanks so much. Uh, we have a question from Anne. Um, thank you, Mecca, and thank you, Diana. Um, yeah, I'd, I want to combine a question that, uh, that was one of the ones I was going to ask of Diana and have you two in conversation with it. Um, Anti-carceral feminism. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, mm. that has been used to mean uh, people working with um, Black people's rights and Black Lives Matter and abolition of prisons um, and mass incarceration mm -hmm. uh, as a illegitimate uh, strategy to um, mm -hmm. to reproduce and promote racial oppression um, in you know this white supremacist country we live in and and so uh, however I hear Diana using anti-carceral feminism in a very different way it's more like mm -hmm. uh, okay we go get the fuckers ourselves I mean let's not mess with jails and stuff like that because that uh, that isn't really of that's just reproducing women as the victims and you know throwing uh, so let's just go get them ourselves um kind of um uh approach um and in any case we should be we should be primed with our ready to fight bodies to um to not be victims so there seems to be uh you know a tension there especially if you want to have coalitions uh, that deal with racial oppression and gender oppression. Um, and I'm also thinking being, uh, you know, an activist using nonviolent techniques of your, of your spiritual turn. I mean, obviously the civil rights movement really, um, and Barbara Deming, for example, really thought of mm -hmm. uh, the, that in some ways, um, you know, a group um, militantly confronting mm -hmm. um, a, 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 an oppressive situation with their bodies, but 
insisting that they were not going to be the ones that struck the blows, um, therefore demanding moral recognition on the part of the others, was in fact ultimately a more powerful force than uh, simply violent bodies that are going to do counter violence. So I just wanted you guys to talk a little bit about this <laughs> tension in your thoughts. Thank you. <clears throat> I think, Diana, you are first. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so to Anne's point about coalitions between anti-carceral feminism and what I, you know, counter-violence uh, counter feminism, which isn't a thing, but I'll just use that as the catch-all here for my, sort of my position. Um, I, I don't, I, I agree with you that I don't think that's an obvious point of coalition for the reasons that you say, but I think that there are possibilities for conversations that could develop into some really interesting coalitions around the productive failure of, you know, um, the police, the courts, in because both groups are recognizing that and attempting to deal with it in different ways. <clears throat> so I. Um, I haven't broached this topic with some anti-carceral feminists that I've been in conversation with yet, but I'm going to, and I, I'm interested to see what they're going to say about it. Um, but it's a conversation that I would, that, that I think would be productively engaged. Um, I think it could, you know, one of the things that I don't know. Anyway, I'll just leave it there. I haven't, it's a, it's a conversation I haven't had yet, but I very much want to have, and it might not go anywhere. But I think if we can highlight, foreground the, the, the productive failure of, of, of state institutions to address all of these problems, then something really important could potentially come out of that. Um, yeah, and the nonviolent thing, I guess I, Merleau-Ponty says, and, and, and it's consistent with Fanon and Beauvoir, they, I, they, Merleau-Ponty says point blank, if you, he says nonviolence or pacifism, when you take that stance, you remove yourself from the realm in which justice and injustice are being debated or deliberated hmm. and i guess i take that pretty seriously mm -hmm. I, we could talk more about that but mm -hmm. I, this is a position i have come to mm -hmm. i haven't always taken mm -hmm. so i don't know if mecca wants to say, say some more about that <laughs> yeah it's 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 uh, complex um so you know i'm in in this five phases of ludic ubuntu right uh, there's a prominent phase um, of of anger right of the need of moving you know of uh, resentment and hate being lower expressions and uh, anger so I'm, I'm really looking at the law of emotions which is a basically a new field in, in law studies legal critical legal studies um, and and that came to me when i looked at the um or the horror of Michael Brown's um, execution and his body um, being displayed for four and a half hours, right, um, on the streets, and his mother couldn't touch her son's um, lifeless body, right? So the lack of piety, you know, um, the lack of, uh, you know, really um, of, of Black lives indeed not mattering, which is a slogan that really came out of the. Trayvon Martin, um, George, George Zimmerman's trial, right? Um, so there's, there's this need for an outcry, right? And, and then the higher expressions to look through restorative justice, you know, and then the TRC was really wedded to the restorative justice aspect and then transformative justice um, that as Diana says, um, the state apparatus don't work. Um, they're extremely unjust and what is it um, that indigenous practices show us as um, 
is you know for, uh, giving us a different way and so there's some really interesting work that you may want to look at is um uh, th uh, that you know you, with uh, with respect to intimate partner violence um to use shuttle diplomacy right uh, so not direct uh, you know um, feminist carceral feminists correctly said you know say that you can't just um, put somebody who's um, who has been violated, um, you know, and assaulted into the same room with somebody who has that power over them, you know, in the moment in terms of psychological power. Yeah. But um, putting folks into different rooms, uh, different spaces, working, you know, giving psychological support um, to the victim is super important. And, and also really figuring out what is it about that oppressor, that person who violates, you know, recurring back to their childhood, you know, what adverse childhood experiences with it. And so this is where the aspect of, of compassion comes in. And for Tutu, just put it very provocatively, there's a bit of the oppressor in me, you know, that recognizes what the apartheid regime did. It's like, yes, I could have been in that position too, if I had been on the other side, yeah. Um, so it is really sort of a dialectical dance, um, and th there is no need to become stoic and saying, "Well, you know, it's all good, and I must, you know, uh, really break bread with that with that person um, who damaged me, you know, in in most horrible ways." Um, but it is really starting, you know, having more complex sense than leaving at what I'm hearing, you know, Merleau-Ponty's view on nonviolence, I st still hear the sentiment of rage and resentment and revenge. And those to me are not productive. Um, you know, at least uh, Ludwig Ubuntu in its higher expression um, would, you know, uh, look at it from more of an observer perspective and saying, well, I understand that perspective, but there may be another way. Yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up really quickly and clarify. I do want to say, because I'm, I'm chair of this, uh, so we are actually at time. Um, I know that there's Courtney and Asha who also had their hands up, but um, if it's okay with Saba and Shay, because I one of the things I do love about Feast is the after conversations. Um, are, would we be able to create a breakout room, like to have an after talk kind of continued breakout room? So if people want to go um, to the after kind of talk place, they can still have these conversations. I think people can stay logged on that want to stay okay. logged on here. And then, um, and then if you want to log off, uh, you know, you go ahead and take your break right yeah. now and then come back at 1130 for the next session. But please try to log on like five minutes before. So 1125 for the next session. Okay. Well, um, we'll, if you want to stay in chat, feel free. I think we can set up the requirements to stay in chat. Uh, but if you please join me in another round of official applause for our presenters. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, keep talking. <laughs> so, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say that I, what, I want to be really clear that I don't want to replace nonviolent approaches with Counterviolence. I'm not saying that counterviolence should always be used. I just want to say that I think it needs to be on the table. And I think that, and Ami addresses this at the beginning of violent bodies, and I think it's true. And I think there are good reasons for this that as feminists, we've tended to say violence is what men do to us. And so we aren't going to engage that. And I want to just bring it back and have it as part of the conversation because I agree with, um, you know, the, the thinkers that I've cited that I think sometimes, sometimes it can be productive and I think sometimes it's needed. And I think that the difficult conversations are around when and how and in light of the fact that violence has this explosive potential that, that Arendt points to and Ami acknowledges and I think is right. Um, so I'm, I want to be clear, I'm not taking an absolutist position and saying counterviolence is always the way to go, but I think sometimes it is. And I think that, and, and I, that's what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm.
Ooh, okay, so who wants to go? I thought I saw another hand. Anybody? Is Asha still in the room? She had her hand up first, and I don't want to speak if she's still hanging out. I can't see the full yeah, screen. So. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I think, really uh, picking up on sort of part of what Shay raised about, you know, preparedness toward violence, and then it's a connection, I think, to um, to Mecca, to your concept of, of um, the ludic Ubuntu, you know, I think there's a way in which preparedness for violence might set the stage for that kind of um, equality that's required for a kind of, you know, um, you know, spiraling out of the state of violence. But uptake conditions are really going to matter here. And I'm wondering about the extent to which the African paradigm will work, say, in the U.S., where our our sort of interpretive scripts for white women and women of color differ so much. So, you know, one of the things that I'm working on right now is violence by white women against women of color and the way that white femininity can be employed to evade, employed such that white women can evade um, accountability for the violence they perpetrate against women of color. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in a way, I mean, I, Mecca, I always find your work so fascinating and, and kind of inspirational, but I'm wondering about its limitations for the American context, where mm -hmm. these kind of racial hierarchy, racial scripts of hierarchy and of, you know, whiteness, and of course, you know, women of color is, a, I'm using it here in a, a deliberately um, schematic and imprecise way, um, where those categories are so different and the, mm -hmm. you know, I think really significant phenomenon of violence by white women against women of color remains um, under sort of, it remains outside our dominant cultural strips that are uh, scripts that are required for the uptake that's needed such that there will be accountability. And also, I mean, the other side of it, of course, is that the preparedness for violence by women of color gets, uh, is, is much more, puts, makes women of color more vulnerable in certain respects than um, mm -hmm. it, um, does so, Diana. I guess this is kind of a question um, addressed to you that it does mm -hmm. um, for white women. Indeed, right. Um, Asha, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, um, accountability is a huge conversation in uh, women of color um, abolitionist circles, right? Uh, so that's that's also a major aspect that I have to grapple with in in my last chapter in my book. Um, and I, yeah, uh, so um, holding folks accountability within um, uh, within groups, you know, um, black queer circles, you know, if you think of Audre Lorde project, uh, various others of how, how is it that we uh, assist um, not only those who are victimized, but those who are also the victimizers, yeah? Um, so that's within um, the um, women of color abolitionist conversations. Um, but there's uh, uh, certainly holding white uh, women, um, uh, you know, uh, accountable. And uh, I love what you're saying is evading that that sense of accountability all the time. We, we, uh, it, is, it is really for formidable. Uh, but note, you know, Fania Davis, who happens to be the sister of Angela Davis, right, was very much inspired um, by um, the call for reparations that came out of the TRC. You know, sort of the unended pro project of TRC was, well, actually, folks need land, yeah, um, who have been robbed of land, you know, um, you know for 400 years, specifically 1910, um, uh, you know, with the, with the white supremacist nation state, um, and then the 1940s, you know, the apartheid regime. And none, none, you know, so the TRC was very limited in its scope um, where it went. Um, but still, there's a lot of inspiration um, for Black abolitionists, feminists in the U.S. Um, to take, uh, um, you know, the, some of the practices. Um, to, to make them work um, uh, with dealing with uh, lynching trauma um, atrocities, right? Um, uh, racist massacres uh, in, in various um, areas. Uh, so 
so I, I um, so yes, I, the, in this book, I have to deal with you know, like how how is this going to be workable, right? But we we have seen you know there's a lot of folks. Maria Macaba um, just uh, published another book, uh, so um, to suggest that the abolitionist way is the way forward. Um, we cannot afford to do anything else. Yeah. I don't think that was very convincing yet, but this is what I'm working out. <laughs> well, hopefully we can talk at the conference next year in person. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Diana, next to you. On to you. Yeah, um, <clears throat> similarly, I, I don't know if I, this is a good answer, but I absolutely, what you say, Asha, is absolutely the case that expressions of violence and I think not just, a, so the expression of it, both in terms of one's relation to oneself and then also in the world um, are not the same for all women, right? And it's absolutely the case that women of color and some, some especially I would say black women, right? The, trans, the way in which the transgression of engagement in violence is experienced and gets interpreted or viewed is very different than in white women. And mm -hmm. I've had conversations with Black feminists about this who have said to me, I am not turning to rage. This is when I wasn't really even talking about counterviolence, but was really focusing on rage. And then I brought, you know, counterviolence came onto the table from that. Um, but they said the affective response that I'm really interested in is talking about joy. Because as Black women, that's an affect, like you, you want to talk about rage being denied as an affect for women. And I think that an affect that Black women are consistently denied is the expression of joy, right? Mm -hmm. And I was having these conversations anyway before the pandemic, and we haven't we haven't come back around to that. But in any case, what I want to say is I'm absolutely going to address those differences and parse that out in the work that I'm doing. Yeah, part and of what I've looked at, for example, is the. Um, there was a letter that black femi or feminists of color, I think it was predominantly black feminists, wrote to the anti-rape movement in, it was an open letter that they wrote to the anti-rape movement during the women's liberation movement, and it resonates in a lot of ways with the open letter that women of color wrote to the slut walk organizers, so there's good material there to be mined in terms of looking at feminists of color who have similar concerns but are saying as white women, you're not, you know, the way you're approaching this is, you know, has blowback for women of color. So I'm trying to be careful in the analysis that I'm doing and I'm still working on it. Yeah, and even how the preparedness can be read as a person being scary, you know, so when a woman of color is prepared for, my, you know, I, I do martial arts, right? And people, there are people who are more scared of me, you know, um, of my comportment and, you know, it's, there are ramifications for that, broad-based ramifications in terms of one's sort of the ascriptions of morality and sort of, you know, just how that fits into our social uh, practices and social structures is, is I think, highly divergent um, for different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think Courtney was our last person, and then everybody get a snack since there's none in the hallway. <laughs> What a loss. No beach, no snacks. Um, so thank you. Thank you both. Um, I think that my question, um, the, the nature of my question, it sort of comes up in some of the examples that both of you are discussing. So I think the implications are uh, maybe relevant for both of you. But I um, uh, personally, the seventh chapter of Ami's book is my favorite piece that she's written. Um, and I spend a lot of time with it. And so Diana, when you were talking, um, the examples that you used and in, in your probably approach through that text kind of made it, um, I, I can see the connections better to your work. Um, so this is directed maybe a little more towards you. Um, and I apologize for that, Mecca. Um, 
when you give some of your examples, uh, I unfortunately I can't point to somewhere in Ami's scholarship where she's published this. I can only think of conversations that she's had, mostly complaints about my own um, style of thinking. Um, when you give some of your examples, I'm wondering if you draw a strict um, limit or definition around what counts as violence. So uh, when I first approached Ami with some of my own work very early on, coming right out of undergrad, um, I sort of wanted to count lots of things as violence. Um, and she responded to me saying that, you know, violence is the punch, it's the kick, um, it could be the bullet, um, but it's not some of these other elements that, you know, Diana, when you mentioned um, the protest is, is one of your examples of counterviolence, you know, are you thinking sort of the broad protest or are you specific, and I know this obviously happens, are you locating violence as those very specific instances where there is the kick or the punch? Because I know I'm drawn to that tendency to say it's all violent, um, but I think that I actually have been convinced over time by Ami's more strict countenance. You know, we have, um, we have all of these other rich uh, conceptual terms that we can use to describe the other elements that might happen, for instance, at that protest, um, especially because Ami is somewhat limited, right? She's concerned about that distinction between uh, ready to fight bodies and, and actual fighting bodies, that comportment. Um, I, I think I do want to reserve the term violence for those more strict circumstances like the punch, the kick, the bullet. Um, I'm wondering if maybe you can say anything about that distinction, whether you're holding on to such a um, confined definition, um, and if so, or if not, even uh, what implications you think that may have for thinking about your position on counterviolence. And like I said, Mecca, I, I think that where you sort of define um, violence, what you think counts, is going to have implications for your piece, but my brain right now can only wrap its head around sort of Diana's uh, example of protest and kind of trying to pull from that, so. Yeah, so the, I mean, I did give that example of protest and what I am talking about is the physical confrontation that takes place within the context of that protest. So I would not say that protest per se as such is violent, but there can be violent protest. And even within protests that isn't intentionally violent, there can be instances of violence with, that occur within that. So I, I too, right, and Courtney and I are, Courtney was my student and she was, we are both students of AMI, so there's a line of descent sort of there. Um, but what I, right now, what I said is I see violence as an embodied violation that inflicts harm against both the physical and lived bodies, because I'm coming at it from a critical phenomenological perspective but i but but so i and what i would say is like there are conditions right like i'm saying gender is normative gender is an oppressive political system that's characterized by oppressive violence but i wouldn't it's a condition for the possibility of expressions of particular expressions of of gendered violence right so i am very much you know still in that arentian mode that ami sort of taught me of being very careful to make distinctions and the distinctions are really important. So I'm trying to make those distinctions um, and to adhere to them at the same time that I guess I do. <laughs> you know, as I said, I think Arendt was not very willing to acknowledge when there was slippage in her work, but there was, it was there. And, and Ami acknowledges that the, the potential for that. Um, also the need to be clear and to be, and to make distinctions at the same time that we recognize that they don't always hold. But that's, I'm so my, the way I'm thinking about violence is very much in tune with the way that you're thinking about it as well. Thank you for that. It sounds then like you do, you certainly have distinctions about what counts as violence. Um, but it seems that if we're going to take sort of a, a gendered approach or a, a more structural approach, right, it's not necessarily going to be the individual act of a kick or a punch. Do we at least have to recognize the sort of the possibility? I think I'm seeing maybe a parallel here between a ready to fight body um, and sort of a um, an on the verge of violence situation because the the gendered aspect is going to be, I think at least in my view, uh, prevalent 
in sort of all contexts, right? And it may be more actionable or less actionable depending on the situation. Um, but it, it sounds like you have that conceptual distinction, but it is going to be broader than at least that little tidbit of um, distinction that I got from Ami where it's a kick, a punch, a bullet, and no more. I'm not sure I understand exactly your question. Um, is the ready to fight body? I think I agree with Ami that the ready to fight body and the violent body are different things. I think they're different. I think, okay. I think being able to engage in a physical confrontation and being ready to do that, being prepared, that's different than actually being involved in a physical confrontation. I would argue that the, um, embodied experience of that, the phenomenology of that are, 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 are different. And I think that we need to, I think it would be good to parse out how they're different, right? Ami says, I think they're different and I want to maintain that difference. But she doesn't go into the sort of phenomenology of that difference. And that might, you know, you just given me, it's like, maybe that's something that I should articulate if, if, if we want to maintain that difference, like how they're phenomenological, how the violent body and the ready to fight body are phenomenologically not the same. They're, they're certainly related, but I don't think they're reducible to one another. Hey, I think that's really helpful. And Naomi, that comment is super helpful. I think that leads me to where I'm going. So thank you so much, both of you, all of you. Okay, we definitely want to thank Diana and Mecca and Tempest uh, for, Diana and Mecca for presenting and Tempest for uh, uh, being the chair for this session. So thank you so much. Um, we can take a two, three minute break and be back like sharp uh, at 1130 because we do want to start on time.